Let's have a look at an example of finding an area of a region in the plane. Um, so the region we're going to look at is the region bef below the graph of 1 over x squared, above the x-axis, which is y equals 0, and to the right of x equals 1. Now this might seem strange at first because there's no you know, top x value in this region, but if you draw the region, so 1 over x squared looks something like this. Okay. It's symmetric about the y-axis. So, And so from x equals 1 to the right of x equals 1, we're getting this, this sort of infinitely long spike shape here. So, um, you know, we can still calculate the area of this using our old tricks, right? To get the area under a graph, it's just the integral from our starting x value of 1 over x squared dx. But <clears throat> what should the top bound be? I mean, there's no finite x value where we should stop accumulating area as we move further and further to the right here. So I guess the top bound here should be infinity. But with, with that in mind, we can go ahead and um, calculate an antiderivative. But, you know, actually it's a little bit suspect to try to use the fundamental theorem of calculus here. Because the fundamental theorem of calculus, right, it was based on an assumption that we were we had two bounds that were finite numbers, and our integrand had to be continuous on the interval from a to b, right? But here we don't have a, a f interval of finite length, so it's not really clear that we can directly use the fundamental theorem of calculus to get at what this should be. But, you know, there's a way around it. What we could do is, instead of trying to immediately use the fundamental theorem of calculus, I guess what we need to do is really define what it means to have an upper bound that is infinity. And one sensible choice of what it should mean is, rather than going all the way to infinity, let's integrate just from 1 up to some finite value. Let's call it t for now. But then we'll take a limit as t goes to infinity. So what we're really doing here is we're integrating from 1 up to t. Right? On this interval, 1 over x squared is perfectly well behaved. It's continuous. So on this interval, since it's a finite interval, we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus. But what we're going to do once we've completed our integral for this finite interval is we're going to take a limit to move this right-hand end uh, as far to the right as we can. In other words, all the way to the right by taking a limit at infinity. So that's the idea here. Um, so now that our bounds are finite bounds, inside this limit, we're free to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we get limit as t goes to infinity of uh, integral of 1 over x squared is minus 1 over x from 1 to t. So this is limit as t goes to infinity of minus 1 over t minus 1 over 1. So we get the limit as t goes to infinity of 1 minus 1 over t. And now we need to actually take this limit, right? This stuff in parentheses, this is the area under the graph from 1 just up to x equals t. But now we're going to let our right-hand x value increase to infinity, and that's what the limit does. Of course, when we take this limit, the only thing that happens is this 1 over t part, its denominator is going to infinity, and so 1 over t goes to 0, and so we just get 1. So it turns out that this, uh, this infinitely long spike, it actually has a finite amount of area, which is maybe a little surprising. But, you know, the, the method that we use to get that result seems perfectly sensible, so we'll go with it. <laughs> This is really a definition, right? What we did here is we defined what it means to have infinity as a bound in terms of a limit. The name for that general phenomenon is a, an improper integral. 
So we call an integral, a definite integral, improper is if one of its bounds is infinity or minus infinity. So if the top bound is infinity, then we interpret this to be a limit as t goes to infinity of an integral from a to t. So here we're just letting the top bound go to infinity. If the bottom bound is negative infinity, so we're going from all the way to the left on the number line up to some x value b, well then <clears throat> we interpret that to be a limit as t goes to minus infinity of an integral from t to b. If both bounds are, infin are infinity, one negative and one positive, we have to be a little more careful. So it's actually necessary to split the integral up in the middle at some, oh, I made a mistake here, <laughs> this should be a. We have to split the integral from minus infinity to infinity up at some value in the middle of the number line, which I've called a. It could be anywhere. It could be at 0 or 1 or 100 or minus a, a million. Um, but we have to split the integral up somewhere. And then we have two improper integrals, one for the positive part, or the large positive part, and one for the negative part. Uh, it turns out if you, if you try to define this limit, if you try to uh, define this double infinite limit like this from minus t to t, it turns out bad things happen. It's a little bit delicate to see why that happens, but it turns out with this, you're essentially you can get into trouble by subtracting infinity from infinity, which causes trouble. So that's why we don't use this limit to define a, an improper integral where both bounds are inf infinite. We split it up into two instead. <clears throat> okay, so we've seen that an improper integral, even though the bound, one of the bounds goes to some infinity, either positive or negative, we've seen that it's possible that it produces a finite result. If an improper integral does produce a finite result, we call that integral convergent. And otherwise, so if this limit, if whichever limit it is, if this limit either is infinity, minus infinity, or if that limit doesn't exist, then we say that the, that integral is divergent. So divergent integrals are sort of the poorly behaved ones, and convergent integrals are the nice ones. It turns out convergent integrals usually behave how you expect, you can break them up over addition and those sorts of things. And divergent integrals often do not behave how you would expect. That's really the problem with this sort of thing. It behaves uh, very poorly if the inter individual integrals are divergent. Let's look at a few examples of some improper integrals. <clears throat> so for one, let's find the area under the graph of uh, 1 over x plus 1 and to the right of x equals 1. So 1 over x plus 1 looks something like this. Okay, so this is, conceptually, this area would be the integral from 1 to plus infinity of 1 over x plus 1. But remember, we need to interpret this as a limit. So this is the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to t of 1 over x plus 1 dx. Uh, now we can do an antiderivative because we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus because our, our interval for integration is finite. <clears throat> so limit as t goes to infinity of, let's see, the antiderivative here is natural log x plus 1 from 1 to t. So now we can evaluate at our bounds. We get limit as t goes to infinity of natural log of t plus 1. I'm dropping the absolute values here because t is positive because we're taking a limit at, as, at plus infinity. So since the stuff inside is already positive, it doesn't matter if we take its absolute value or not. Minus natural log of, looks like it's going to be 2. OK, now we need to take a limit. But the limit of this natural log part, right? the thing, the stuff inside the natural log is going to infinity as t goes to infinity. And natural log, as its input goes to infinity, natural log goes to infinity. So here we have an infinite limit. So we have something going to infinity minus natural log 2. That, that whole thing is infinity. So this, this, uh, sorry, this integral 
is actually divergent. It doesn't really have a well-defined value other than in, uh, infinity. So this region, this particular infinitely long spike, actually has an unbounded amount of area. It's a little bit funny because it looks so similar to the one in, the, in our first example, but the region in our first example had a finite amount of area, and this one has an infinite amount of area. So we're picking up kind of a subtle, subtle difference here. The difference is, you know, our first example was 1 over x squared. The difference between these two, other than, other than the fact that they're shifted horizontally a bit, the difference is that 1 over x squared, the graph of 1 over x squared, that infinitely long spike gets thinner much faster than the infinitely long spike under the graph of 1 over x plus 1. So it turns out that the spike on 1 over x squared gets thin enough, fast enough, that there's actually only a finite amount of area. All right, so for another example of an improper integral, let's find the volume generated by rotating that region that we just looked at around uh, the x-axis. So again, the region is from 1 out to infinity, and this is a graph of y equals 1 over x plus 1. So if we're rotating this around the x-axis, it looks like we're using washers. So this is going to be the integral, I'm sorry, disks, uh, the integral from 1 to infinity of. So to do disk, we need pi r squared. So pi, the radius is just the function. So 1 over x plus 1 squared dx. Of course, we need, this is an improper integral, so we need to evaluate this in terms of a limit. So this is limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to t of pi times 1 over x plus 1 squared dx. So limit as t goes to infinity of pi times Let's see, minus 1 over x plus 1 from 1 to t. So now plug in our bounds. This is limit as t goes to infinity of pi times. So plugging in t, we get minus 1 over t plus 1 minus, and then plug in 1, and we get minus 1 over 2. Yes. Now when we take the limit as t goes to infinity, this term that has t in the denominator just goes to 0. And so our final result is pi times 1 half, so pi over 2. So this integral converges. This is sort of a, a weird feature of improper integrals. It's sometimes surprising, geometrically speaking, sometimes uh, it's surprising some, how some of them converge when you wouldn't expect, and some of them diverge when you wouldn't expect. So this region here, it has an infinite amount of area. That was the last example. But if you rotate it, it has a finite amount of volume, which is a little counterintuitive, but it must be true, because after all, we just proved it.